Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College, and this is video C that focuses on the internal anatomy of the heart. It's always easier to understand heart anatomy if we right away label all the chambers. So here we have our right atrium, here we have our left atrium, here we have our right ventricle, and here we have our left ventricle. Notice that the left ventricle once again has a thick myocardium. As a matter of fact, the myocardium that separates the left ventricle from the right ventricle is referred to as the interventricular septum, the internal ventricular septum. On the outside of the heart, we would refer to that region as the interventricular um, sulcus with the coronary vessels located in there. Now arising from the inside of the ventricles, we see these nipple-like muscles and they're referred to as papillary muscles. Papillary always refers to nipple-like. And notice that these nipple-like papillary muscles are attached to the strings of valves. And we refer to those strings as the chordae tendinae, literally meaning tendon-like cords. We see these chordae tendinae only attached to the valves that are sitting in between an atrium and a ventricle. Those valves we call atrioventricular valves in general. So atrioventricular valves are ventricles, I'm sorry, are valves that separate, I can't talk and write obviously, atrioventricular valves, they sit in between uh, the atria and the ventricles. So we can talk about the right atrioventricular valve and the left atrioventricular valve. But typically we give these valves more specific names and we do that based on how many cusps these valves have, how many little doors they have. Kind of hard to see these little doors, we'll see that better in just a moment. So the right atrioventricular valve has three cusps, so we call it the tricuspid valve. The valve on the left has only two cusps, so we call it a bicuspid valve. Or most often in hospitals, you'll hear it being referred to as a mitral valve. And uh, it refers to the mitre of a bishop. I don't know if you know what that looks like, but you've seen the pope or bishops wear this hat that um, kind of looks like this. And so you can think of it as it having an anterior side and then there would be the posterior side. So there's two portions to it. That's kind of what the mitral valve looks like. Now in addition to the atrioventricular valves, we also have valves located at the base of the major arteries that leave the heart. And that is at the base of the aorta, you can barely see it here, and at the base of the pulmonary trunk, which we can very clearly see here because of how the heart is twisted. We refer to those valves collectively as semilunar valves and that literally means that their cusps look like the shape of a half a moon semi half lunar luna referring to moon and depending on whether they sit at the base of the pulmonary trunk or aortic uh, or aorta they're referred to as the pulmonary valve versus aortic valve these semilunar valves, as you can see, do not have any chordae tendinae attached to them. But I want to come back to these chordae tendinae that we do see attached to the atrioventricular valves, and they are also attached to these nipple-like muscles referred to as the papillary muscles. The importance here is that these papillary muscles they will contract first when the, heart, when the heart starts to contract or when the ventricles start to contract. Remember that the ventricles tend to start contracting from the apex area and we'll see very clearly how that all works once we get to the physiology of the heart. 
But ultimately, what we um, also see happening is that these papillary muscles contract first and foremost. And as they do that, they pull on these chordae tendineae, and that's going to prevent the cusps from flying backwards into the atria such that blood will not flow backwards into the atria. Remember, the atria are going to be collecting blood from their veins. From the atria, the blood will then drain into the, the ventricles. The responsibility of the ventricles is to squeeze the blood into their corresponding arteries, whether it's the pulmonary trunk or the aorta. And as they squeeze, they do not want the cusps of the valves to be pushed into the, those atria because if that were to happen, our blood from the ventricles would move backwards into the atria. That should not happen. So by tightening these cusps, by contracting these papillary muscles first and foremost before full contraction occurs of the heart, we can prevent backflow. People who have malfunctioning valves, like a malfunctioning mitral valve, for instance, might see some backflow. We refer to that as a prolapsed valve sometimes. The final structure that I'd like to point out on this diagram is the so-called fossa ovalis, which refers to as oval window, which is a... Um, a covered and non-functioning opening between the two atria, approximately here. So once again, in the fetus, we saw something present that closes off as the, the baby is born. We saw a connection in between our aorta and pulmonary trunk called the ligamentum arteriosum on a previous slide. But we also, in the fetus, have this connection between the right and the left atrium, which tells you that in the fetus, blood could actually go from the right to the left atrium. Once again, once you learn about the circulation in the fetus, this will make more sense. That opening closes off, and once it's closed off, we call it the fossa ovalis. Sometimes babies are born with that opening not completely closed, and then people will say, oh, my baby has a heart and it's a, a, a hole in its heart that didn't close right, and so they'll typically that little baby will need surgery to fix that. And yet another structure I really should point out are the trabeculi carni, um, literally, literally meaning the network of the flesh. And what you see here is this, this fleshy muscle of the heart, particularly in the ventricles. I'm pointing to it right here in the ventricles. We see that network here um, of the muscle tissue. That is what we refer to as the trabeculae carnii. Here we see a really beautiful photo illustrating those... Um, you can see those trabeculae carnii really well in this nice photograph, as well as the nipple-like papillary muscles that hold on to the chordae tendineae, which in turn hold on to the atrioventricular valves. Here we see a great image that'll help you understand why the valves get their names and what they exactly look like. So we've pretty much sliced off the top of the heart and even the blood vessels to better illustrate the inside of the heart. This is the posterior side of the heart and of course therefore here is the anterior side of the heart. Let's first focus on the atrioventricular valves which separate the atria from the ventricles. The right side of the heart has a tricuspid valve. Notice that we see one, two, three cusps. I often remember that the tricuspid valve is on the right side of the heart. I think of the letter R in tricuspid. That's sort of a little trick I use. The bicuspid valve, therefore, is on the right side of the heart. 
and we see only two cusps, bicuspid, bi meaning two, and it looks like the mitre of a, um, of a bishop. Your semilunar valves, all of them have three cusps, and they look very much alike, each cusp sort of resembling half a moon. And so this wraps up the internal anatomy of the heart.